Privacy is Fungibility is name of a work in progress paper um, that I'm currently working on, as the name would imply. Um, and uh, I'll try and get through it in good enough time um, that one of two things happens when I give talks. I either go very, very quickly, in which case we'll have loads of time for Q&A, or I try and rate it in, and then I talk way too slowly, and then we'll have no time for Q&A. Um, but hopefully there'll be enough time for you to pick it apart a bit, which will really, uh, really, really help me out. So uh, about me, uh, back in ancient time, I did an econ history degree. Um, I then spent 10 years as a software engineer, and I spent a lot of that working on what they used to call Web3, which was the semantic web. And of course, now it's been rebranded re to blockchain. Um, so I went and worked in blockchain for several years and still still do, because I guess I like that that definition, or I like that the, the name, even if I don't agree on the definition. Um, and so here's the abstract for the paper. I'll give you about two, three seconds to get through that. Okay, everybody, um, cool, everybody up to speed? Right, what does it, but what does it actually mean, right? Uh, so there's there's actually three key ideas to this paper. Um, I, I don't know why I even gave the whole of the abstract for the, for this talk. I thought it would put everybody off, so I don't know why I did it. There's actually only three, three kind of things I wanna talk about. Um, first of all, it's super simple, right? Ledger rewrites happen really quite often. Um, the second one is that the risk threshold for users, like engaging in the system as agents, uh, is knowledge of, of their existence. Uh, that's a pretty pretty low threshold. And the third one is that crypto assets are maybe uh, better classified as credit. And I'll use a, a model that was actually written a, a quite a long time ago in 2005 as a kind of basis for that argument. Um, and that was kind of a perspective model that was looking at the potential of future e-money systems. And they were oddly prescient in what they kind of predicted. Um, so the, to, I'll just, at the top of this, I'll kind of just go over a few of these key ideas. So the first one is that these ledger rewrites happen often. Um, this affects what you might call le uh, layer zero protocols. So blockchains, uh, you know, all the way up to uh, smart contract. The vectors are obviously very different. Usually the mechanism is upgrades, okay? Um, what you would call in the ISO definitions of terms, uh, hard forks, okay? Um, and, and we all know this. We all know that the tokens are at risk. Um, if you are a person on the street, you ask somebody, is this stuff risky? They go, yeah, your tokens are at risk. If you work in this area for years, your tokens are at risk. It's only people who really believe the, the hype and the marketing around these uh, permissionless ledgers that, that think that there is, there is no risk of loss of funds. Um, and what we'll talk about later is how you can extend protocols to kind of add in additional controls that actually give you a surprising amount of additional guarantees that things outside of the pure technical definition of, of, a, of a protocol uh, won't happen as out-of-band events that result in potential loss or, or kind of Byzantine effect, uh, events, I suppose, if we're talking about kind of consensus. So the minimum requirement for being at risk of loss of funds or at the, at the least, the loss of the ability to transact uh, that is fungibility, um, is simply knowing that an address exists. Um, like I said, that's a, a really, really low bar. And I think people sort of intuitively know this, even if a lot of the theory behind it hasn't been done, but maybe don't take it that seriously as a risk because they think it just won't happen. Um, and that's not really the case. So if any of you are science fiction fans, uh, Lu uh, Shishin wrote a book called The Dark Forest. And this is exactly uh, the scenario described in that book, right? which is that if you move, if you identify yourself, you die. Um, although losing your funds probably isn't bad to die, but nevertheless, uh, the other thing that increases your risk on top of being known is that your balance is known. And that again, will, will build out from a case study from this paper from 2005. Um, so a number of things to reduce this risk uh, outside of these theoretical models, a lot of them fall under this sort of blanket term that we've heard called uh, decentralization. Great, what does decentralization actually mean? Um, I've, it's very, very hard to come up with a definition of decentralization. And while I was doing this talk, I realized that I just assumed everybody would knew, know what I meant. Uh, but it's actually super, super difficult to come to a kind of consensus on the, on the sort of uh, actual definition of it. Um, I found yesterday a paper from somebody at UCL um, called J.P. Verne. Um, which is all about uh, decentralization theater, which is essentially the equivalent of um, virtue signaling, but for stories about decentralization and the metric you should pay attention to um, when talking about decentralization. And a lot of these metrics sort of, he argues, 
uh, depend on how you're marketing to your your consumers, your kind of agents that, that you want to use your blockchain. Um, although obviously he's sort of using it as critique and in a somewhat sat satirical way, if you try and take them as written and actually say, okay, well, what if we actually believe their claims that these metrics are important? A couple of these metrics are actually very useful for us to talk about uh, decentralization. Godot, which is, you know, uh, we talk about decentralization theater, so his tropes follow theater and musical theater. The waiting for Godot analogy is that you have a system that is resilient on a number of axes. So you wait for an attack, which never comes. So, you know, coincidental with the, the name of the play. Um, and then bucket decentralization, which is all about sort of economic inequality. And we can, I, I'm going to kind of clumsily simplify the Godot case to sort of systemic resilience uh, of sort of power and uh, economic resilience um, from this kind of bucket decentralization, which, you know, that's when we talk about economic resilience, especially in proof of stake systems, we're really talking about voting power. And so it, when we talk about inequality, it's less about kind of uh, some sort of moral case on on inequality and more about systemic uh, sort of um, resilience in the face of a powerful entity coming along and attacking the system. Uh, and the third major point, right, uh, most crypto assets we see in the wild might be better classified as credit uh, rather than as money, uh, multilateral credit specifically. Um, and this, again, follows the model in this paper that I mentioned, which is um, Khan et al's. Privacy is money from 2005. So Summary again, ledger rewrites happen often. Uh, the risk threshold for users is pretty, pretty low. Um, and crypto assets may be better defined as credit. Those are the three things that paper kind of, uh, is addressing. Uh, these positions are built uh, from use cases, um, so studies, uh, uh, use case studies. Uh, I'm actually garbled that pretty badly. From case studies in the Cosmos ecosystem where I've worked for a couple of years. Um, and also by extending privacy as money um, by Karl McAndrews and Roberts, which is a really, really interesting paper uh, providing some models of the trade-offs between uh, priv uh, privacy in the case of credit, bilateral and multilateral, and uh, money in a kind of cash sense. And it, a lot of, the, like any kind of model, you have to take assumptions in order for the whole party to happen. Um, so if you're prepared to take on board the assumptions that they lay out in the paper, um, there's some really interesting stuff there. And it kind of generally seems to support the things that I've seen at least happen in the wild. So um, obviously we're building in the, the kind of future of money area where I work. And obviously thank you to Jeff for tolerating all my shower thoughts that have gone into this paper. Um, we're building a theory of change around privacy. So obviously I would be super, super biased um, from having done a lot of economics in my background and currently working on privacy to saying that these things are important. So that's... Yeah, and we're primarily discussing proof of state ledgers because it's the Cosmos ecosystem. I'll define some more terms later when we need them. Um, and it's split into these kind of four areas, a kind of uh, discussion of immutability, agents and systems, case studies in Cosmos, and then finally talking about the paper. I almost wonder, and then feedback, you know, kind of welcomed on this one, whether I should discuss privacy as money first, but, you know, tell me afterwards if you think this is back to front. Um, final thing, uh, before we get into case studies and whatnot, opinion corner, program, programmable money is really, really cool. Uh, programmable incentive systems are really, really, really cool. Uh, but they're governed by these protocols that create a complex system um, that extends kind of beyond the technical. And as implementers, as computer scientists, as engineers, we often get a little bit excited about the protocols and this, we don't see the wood for the trees. So that's it's good for me because it allows me to write a paper on that gap, but it's you know bad for users who might be at risk of loss of funds. Um, so, limits of immutability. Um, code can change state. Who knew? Right? Uh, whoa. Um, but we assume because we're working on ledgers that this is actually not the case. And it's like, well, no, all you ever had is governance over code changes. Um, and no matter how good the playbook is of the people who are writing the code, that might be a group of open source developers, that might be a foundation, a core team, any number of different constructs that we see. They're going to encounter things like hard forks, just software upgrades, right? Um, cyber attacks, disaster recovery, adversary environments. These happen very frequently. I've worked on the blockchain core team, and I've seen what happens when you are losing potentially millions of dollars of uh, lot of value every day because you've been cyber attacked. You know, what are you prepared to sacrifice on the ultra professionalism to get that system up and running again, right? Um, and this means that governance over code changes is a 
oftentimes a lot more flexible than you would see in industry. And that represents a serious cybersecurity problem. Um, so especially where immutability and proof of stake is driven by economic finality, right? So finality is achieved, uh, it's fast finality, and it's achieved through financial incentives. So on a technical level, all you really need to do to change a ledger in a lot of cases is stop it, change some state, and then change the invariant checks that say that that state is incorrect. And I think not a lot of people really appreciate I'll hand wave away that there is that, you know, it's you have, it's a pretty big brain move, but it is quite easy to do in the grander scheme of easy and hard technical problems. Um, so what economic finality means is that simply the cost of a rewrite is too high, right? That's, that's the real thing that's protecting all of the party happening. So we're thinking of metrics like market cap and total value locked, uh, total value staked, you know, again, a different way of looking at and proof of stake. Um, and, and it very much assumes, like from a very, very early point of design, if you look at the papers around Tendermint in the early days, there's a lot of assumptions. Again, these are people who are computer scientists. They spent a lot of time thinking about Byzantine fault tolerance. There's this really big assumption that agents are rational. And that's just not really the case uh, at, at any point of the agent pyramid that we're going to see. Um, so, and that overprivileges the protocol implementation over how it's actually going to operate in the real world. So talking about these agents, um, we're going to see our friend JP again in a minute. Um, there are kind of these social systemic factors that uh, are at play from a number of different stakeholders. Who, who are these stakeholders? I don't, I'm not going to assume you're super familiar with proof of stake systems, so I'll lay out some of those. Um, typically, there's like foundations or a core team um, that kind of steward the software, they're responsible for the roadmap. I don't really know why people use the term foundation, other than I guess a lot of these are based in the Cayman Islands and foundation is the legal entity. So maybe that's just stuck as a kind of um, term. I could be wrong about that. Um, and then there's usually a core team, which is kind of a strategic team. They're not usually technical always. And then there's people who work on the software that could include people from whatever company or open source group are building the, the software. And it could also involve third party contributors. Typically there's a lot of, um, kind of meme, meme pictures and semi anons in this kind of world. So again, you know, just the extent that there are random names on GitHub contributing to your software on a pretty regular basis and people are like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, you know, we know who Cloud Pepe 69 is. Um, they've, they've never done anything bad before. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so, and then validating stake because that's obviously super, super essential to how proof of stake works. Uh, all of these agents are technically described and implied by the protocol um, but not their power relationship and not how they will interact. It's kind of, again, a lot of the time, the assumption is that there will be strategic direction and there will be stewarding and there will be good decisions where there need to be decisions. Um, and then the rest of it will be help, will be handled kind of by bottom up, you know, uh, the bucket decentralization, right? We all know, yeah, you know, we're all equal. We all own the protocol, Every, you know, land of milk and honey. It's all going to be fine. So our, our theory of change um, when talking about digital currencies and kind of where we want to take these things is that uh, privacy um, and tools like it, there are a number of different things you can do. Privacy is just one, that's what we're kind of focused on, um, kind of adds to these protocols at, at a technical level to essentially add like a red line beyond which you can't go. Um, these, these kind of technical social systems have these sort of unwritten constitutions in between their agents like you know, if you have a judicial dispute, effectively developers, if you have a kind of code as law, which a lot of people say a lot, it's not really true, but whatever, uh, developers are kind of taking on a judicial responsibility to change code and enforce a decision. Um, if you make it so that they can't see state because of privacy guarantees, then they don't have to make that decision. So it's very, very easy to add quite ostensibly small changes at kind of like a requirements level that fundamentally change the incentive model and what you can do in these systems. Um, I said we'll see our friend JP again. I can't believe I only found this yesterday. It's great. So this is a model of decentralization with information dispersion on one axis, decision-making dispersion on the other. Not hugely important. I really recommend reading the paper. It's good fun, good clean fun. Um, but information dispersion, you can kind of think about something like top secret clearance. So it's like what, what information you have access to and decision-making dispersion is who can make decisions, right? And you'll notice that independently of me, he's kind of got this hierarchy that pretty much corresponds to what I've seen in the wild uh, in a completely different ecosystem. I think he's talking about Ethereum here. Uh, the only difference with our model, we sort of said with the agents earlier, is that um, 
wallets or stakers in a proof of stake system do actually get decision making power, whereas here they don't. That's both good because all of our agents have agency, but it also introduces a potential risk vector. Um, intuitively, right, stakers and validators have the most impact on finality because when it's functioning as intended, they determine finality because they are securing it with their stake. And in a governance process, they're also securing it with their voting. Um, the combination of block finality and governance finality, again, is one of these interesting gray areas where a lot of systems that have grappled with this uh, have some concept of governance voting, and then they have some concept, usually around, again, software upgrades, it's always the spicy one, um, but also around block finality. And both of them are kind of governed by um, validators and stakers because they hold voting power. Um, but then you start to introduce arbitrary changes and that sort of breaks down a little bit, which leads us on to our case studies. So I'm just going to throw a whole bunch of times when ledgers in Cosmos have been changed uh, just for funsies. So this is an ecosystem of, uh, oh, I'll talk about it in a second. Okay. So key here is protocol enforced events of state are routinely overwritten, uh, rewritten, overridden, messed around with, um, yeah. So Cosmos, if you're not familiar with it, it's about 60 production chains uh, backed by Tendermint, which is now called Comet BFT, which is a bit awkward for us because uh, our project is also called Comet, so a lot bigger, so maybe we need to rename it, but Jeff Jeff hasn't committed to that yet. Uh, he says we're here first. So, um, and the Cosmos SDK. It has another interesting property, which is the Interblockchain Communication Protocol, uh, which means all of the blockchains have kind of a primitive to send data packets between each other. Um, it's a really interesting area for studying blockchains because not only are there a lot of them in one place, but they have a lot of inherent similarities because of their stack. And you can quite clearly contrast their communities, their governance decisions, their development teams. And, and, and look, I imagine there's just tons of research you could do in this ecosystem, and I haven't even scratched the surface, so there you go. Um, this is the anatomy of a, of a kind of typical Cosmos chain. You have the, the Tendermint stack here, which is your consensus and your networking. ABCI, which is your application blockchain interface, uh, and that basically allows you to build a state machine on top of. Right? So all that Tendermint does is go, I'm going to deterministic with all of some stuff, and then it's up to you to decide how the state machine party happens on top of that. Cosmos SDK ships out the box with a bunch of things that make the assumption you're building a proof of state chain, like X staking. Also, every module starts with X, because X is a cool letter, I guess, or whatever, man. Um, so literally nobody even knows there's even a question in the core docs like by a contributor being like why x and everyone's like yeah, that's kind of a cool letter um so the idea is that rather than implementing custom functionality for whatever your application needs to do the smart contracts or anything you just add these kind of go modules onto the top of the sdk they essentially enforce invariants right so back to the software upgrade case like what does it take to actually change a blockchain uh, it takes a knowledge of how to kind of recover the state of the blockchain into a different state and then make sure it's invariance passed so that state is valid. Um, so you can kind of see how, like, as soon as you think about it as like a networking stack and a state machine stack, then changing the state machine and making it do what you want, if you can stop the chain, that's not all that hard. Um, so a bit of technical context for, again, proof of stake in the context of Cosmos. There's a thing called the slasher. Right. It was first outlined by Vitalik uh, uh, of Ethereum fame in a blog post many, many years ago. Um, and it essentially functions the same way, which is essentially you have an N1-ish at some point in the past. And at some point in the future, after a window has expired, you have to say, I am a node on this network. And here is my proof that 13 hours ago, I knew this specific number. If you can't provide that, it means your node must be down and you get slashed. And there's an economic penalty right, for not providing that. Um, so both the operators of the, of the node, presumably, because they've had to self-stake um, some amount in order to make that node live, plus its delegators are penalized. Typically, a soft slash is a small amount. We're talking like 0.1% maybe of total stake. Um, so usually not a huge amount of, of, of money. It results in a jailing event the validator can unjail later. The interesting one is hard slashing, right, which is equivocation. Almost the only case you ever, ever see this is uh, by Xantine Fold. And almost the only time you ever see a Byzantine fault is because somebody has tried to recover a node that did something funny and they forgot that they had already committed a block or pre-committed a block. And then they basically sign two versions of the same thing. Uh, double sign, sad times, uh, results in a tombstoning event. All a tombstoning event is is uh, a 
perpetual jailing and a big loss of funds. On some networks, the tombstoning event is a 10% uh, deletion of funds. So <laughs> especially when the market is up, this is going to be like almost a comically large amount of money. I shouldn't laugh because uh, it is actually you know, quite bad, um, especially because it tends to happen as a result of mistakes. Although, because we're in a kind of trustless system, when somebody says, oh, no, we've, we've tombstone. And sometimes, you know, when these things happen, especially around upgrades, you know, it will be two or th typically two or three or more operators might hit the same problem at the same time. You know, what's to say this isn't actually a cartel that was trying to do something funny at the upgrade? And then they got their state update wrong and then they tombstone. There's a lot of trust involved in that. Um, so, you know, back to everything's just social. The protocols don't really help us. Uh, oh, is it going to go forward? There we go. So technical context on two, governance is used for many functions of Cosmos SDK. Configuration changes, upgrades typically go through uh, this governance voting process from stakers and validators. Um, so particularly hard forks, to use the ISO term, so a disjoint in where the software up version changes to the extent that you cannot add blocks unless you are now all on a completely new and incompatible version of the software. Um, they need a governance approach. The chain halts at, at a predetermined block, the upgrade happens, and then we move on if we have enough voting power. So what's then happened? So hard forks, soft forks, has taken rewritten? Yeah, of course it has, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here talking about it. So here's three networks where tombstone validators that were hard slash were reinstated. In some cases, uh, you know, I think all three cases, the uh, effect of the slash was also revoked. So it was a double whammy of the validator was not published, for, was not punished for Byzantine behavior and had their status reinstated uh, as an active validator, were unjailed and balances were altered. So kapow. Um, one of these is super interesting because it was unilateral. So a mistake happened during an upgrade that was from the core team and they suspected that there was about to be a slashing event because pre-commits had already been submitted. Uh, it's kind of complex to say why you can predict that, but essentially if you know that not everybody has successfully upgraded, there's a good chance that the proportion of the validator set incorrectly think that there is a Byzantine uh, um, event occurring and they will submit evidence at the failed block when the chain starts to move forward, tombstoning everybody that had the audacity to actually upgrade their node on time. So sometimes answering pager duty in the middle of the night is not a virtue if you want to avoid a tombstoning. The other two were super interesting as they were voted on and passed by stakers. So the event happened and people went, right, we're going to go to governance and get our money back, effectively. Um, so that's super interesting. That wasn't designed as part of the protocol. Uh, another interesting one, not punishing equivocation. So uh, there's a concept where networks can lease out their uh, validator set to new ones. Uh, in a kind of consumer provider relationship. This is very, very new. And so they didn't actually finish the implementation to cover automatic tombstone, to cover automatic punishing of equivocations. Instead, they gated it behind governance. There's a really interesting blog post by in the form of some of the core developers in the Cosmos ecosystem on why this mechanism was designed the way it was. The long and short of it is that there was a consensus breaking, a hard fork upgrade that developers on the neutral network that developers thought would be a soft fork. So everybody just updates when they feel like it, blocks continue, whatever. Instead, what happened was they got over the point where 33% of voting power or 33.4% of voting power had upgraded and the chain halted. Some people panicked, they messed around with things while trying to get the nodes back up. And then when things started moving again, tombstones. And there were a couple of them. So on the Cosmos Hub, which is, I believe, something like total value locked over a billion dollars, maybe $2 billion, they then have to punish Byzantine behavior on this network that's leasing economic security from them, they put up the vote to say, right, hard slash, here we are. The, the cost would have been a couple of million dollars, at least, I think, maybe per validator or over the both of them. And it was voted down by the community, by the community of stakers on that chain. We went, no, no harm, no foul. Do can we prove it's not Byzantine? No, nope, but we're not going to punish it anyway. So you can see how this kind of incentivizes potential Byzantine behavior in future, like cartels and stuff like that. That's not really even the point of this paper, but it's just kind of an interesting side. So, and then one of the more insane examples is just a straight up ledger rewrite. Um, governance vote to appropriate $100 million worth of funds 
occurred in the Juno network. This was a text upgrade. So the software to enforce the judgment wasn't even provided with it. It was just, this actor should not have these funds because they have gained the airdrop at the genesis of the chain. We're going to appropriate them to community pool. Pure and simple. Do we have a way of implementing it? Nope. Do we know what the consequences are? Nope. Um, it got very, very nasty. Uh, it did pass. And so you might think of it as kind of a non-binding referendum, right? Um, you, a lot of other stuff. Um, and the value of the chain went down by 10 times. And uh, members of the core team were, were doxing each other and uh, posting Zoom calls where there's you know, clips of Zoom calls where they've been screaming at each other. Uh, threatening to sue each other and whatnot, and it, it was super, super messy. In the end, it was resolved by carrying it out it after a fashion, putting the funds into an escrow um, forcibly. The entity obviously did not want this. Um, the stakers wanted the funds gone, so nobody was happy in the end, which is the sign of a good compromise. Um, but the funds were put into a smart contract escrow, whereby technically the entity could withdraw them, but had to justify the reason for it, otherwise they might run the risk of being burned, and stakers could not withdraw them to the community pool either until uh, a suitable, essentially, impasse had been, had been kind of got past. I think this is inter interestingly the first time that such a large amount of money has actually been dealt with in a quasi-judicial way by a smart contract, but that's kind of, again, another aside. The question here really is whether this is actually economic finality in action, because remember, the whole point for economic finality is that it's too costly to do a, a rewrite. Tanking the token price 10 times, that might be too costly to do a rewrite, but the rewrite still happened. So back to rationality. Was it rational to carry it through? No. Did people want to do it? Yes. Who knew? Um, the other thing was, though, this was around the time of the yeah, terror crash very shortly after this. So we, and that, another piece of research, something I also want to do is work out whether or not what, what amount of that loss was due to uh, the rewrite of the ledger disambiguate from the rest of the market's movement. Um, so final thought before we move on, and we're going to talk about credit and money and other fun stuff. If tokens are credit and stakers are creditors, then can credit be withdrawn, right? So was that example simply that, look, they're not money. We shouldn't be thinking about these tokens as money. It's credit. It's multilateral credit. And a huge proportion of the credit pool said, we don't want to extend this credit anymore. Yeah, it's a bit of a shower thought, but whatever. I wanted to put it in there. So. Um, there are actually a few more examples, but very, very quickly, governance votes claw back and truncate wallets that hadn't transacted in the network again. Again, this was an airdrop, millions of dollars, osmosis network. Governance vote to claw back a development grant. Uh, a developer had been given a couple million dollars in uh, vesting funds to continue to develop on a network. Prematurely, after a couple of staff losses, people decided, oh, we think this is a risk factor. We're going to pass, again, text proposal to say, we're going to claw back those funds. No implementation. We're going to work that out later past um and look some of these are pretty valid like the last one is just a contract dispute you know maybe they shouldn't have like allocated all those funds up front and come up with a better way of releasing those over time fine but <laughs> none of these are within the scope of the the way the protocols were designed and they do show there's a systemic risk that, that, that you know just can't be hand waved away because in a lot of these cases it's only because the people exploiting these holes were doing it kind of for what they consider to be good reasons, right? That it all panned out for some definition of okay. Okay. So having publicly observable state that can change by code is a risk factor. And all this state can be changed by code, at least in this ecosystem. Another extension of this work would be to look at many more, especially proof of state networks tend to work this way with account-based abstractions. Um, finally, before we go on from Cosmos, <clears throat> really prosaically, the number of validators required to stop a chain is like super low usually bad if these disputes happen, right? So going back to, I'm talking about Byzantine fault tolerance. If you're not familiar with the, the, the basic premise of it is that uh, N minus one over three uh, is, is, is the number of um, faulty nodes that you can deal with, right? So th that's why I keep saying 33.3, uh, no, 33.4, which is the amount required to pull the chain or to veto essentially any governance proposal, any software upgrade to just be a right pain in the ass for people to try and get work done. Um, so this is complicated by voting power in a lot of proof of stake systems where it's not actually the number of nodes, but it's the proportion of voting power that matters. Um, so concentration of voting power, back to Vern's thing of um, 
inequality mattering, right? It's not a moral uh, question of inequality. It's a question of systemic problems. If you all your voting power is concentrated in one or two validators, those validators can stop the chain, right? That's the, the bucket decentralization that he talked about. So DYDX chain at launch had one validator with over 34% of voting power. I think it's 40%. Um, so, and, and the funny thing is this, this uh, foundation had come from Ethereum where they ran L1s over there, uh, sorry, L2s over there. They didn't even realize this was a problem until others in their validator set reached out to them saying, you do realize that you have a validator with a gun to your head and you, you, know, you have like hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. Um, so they had to basically reach out to people and try and change that and, and decentralize. And uh, I think as of now, or as of a couple of days ago when I checked, um, I think you need three validators, whole three, to get over 34% of voting power on that network. Yeah, that's that's impossible to coordinate, right, between three people uh, or three entities. So anyway, as of 25th of Jan 2024, number of validators required to get over that percentage, uh, VP, Evmos Network 5, Cosmos Hub 7, say 7, Osmosis, etc. They're all under 10, right? Or 10 in the case of Osmosis. So finally, I've kind of said everything's awful. I'm going to say, hey, there's something cool, which is privacy can actually solve a lot of these things. And they predicted in 2005 because they're legends. So privacy is money. We're going to quickly talk about that paper. I have run over my 30 minutes. So uh, as I said at the top, the minimum requirement for a consumer to be at risk is that they identify themselves. Uh, I say, I'm saying agent, consumer is the term used in this paper. Um, and risk is higher uh, when a balance is known. In their case, they're talking about loss of goods in a, initially in a barter economy and then an economy with mixed credit and money. Um, and there's another key idea, which is that in a model of both cash and credit, um, buyers will tend to prefer money over credit. And actually, in certain situations, uh, sellers will also prefer money over credit. Money confers greater privacy, which kind of avoids uh, the cost of theft, which obviously currently has a, a loss of utility. Um, they basically show that uh, as a starting point, there's a, a lot a lot of models here. But the interesting, the, the most important, like top level ones, we're going to just say anything about anything, is that it's very, very unlikely for someone to randomly just try and steal from an agent. This is their, their proof of that, essentially, um, which, which has quite a big breakdown. I'll share the slides later. But essentially, the top line here is A, uh, alpha, uh, N over one, uh, is the expected uh, likelihood of a successful theft. Uh, uh, epsilon F is the utility to the, to, to the thief, and C is the cost of them uh, attempting a theft, right? And so where N is the size of a population, it's quite easy to see that this is just not going to work out in your favor, right? C, C would have to be absolutely tiny for your expected to return to be worthwhile. So they make that kind of core assumption that unless you know the person you're stealing from has a good and you want to steal it, your utility as a robber is not going to be uh, worthwhile. Um, which also does apply, right? If you know who it is, it's just uh, alpha, epsilon, F, with C, right, which is minus C, which actually quite possibly is worth your while. Um, and then if you don't know who it is, uh, so this is actually uh, more related to the, the case where you get complete privacy. Again, this is actually uh, assumed to be negative uh, for the reasons kind of already discussed. So they have a bunch of models. Um, I'll briefly, briefly go over these. Um, so the bilateral informational goods received Basically, these are all about who you're identifying yourself to. So that's barter, but you reveal yourself to who your, your co-party is. Uh, two, three is you reveal it to everybody in the economy. You can see how that would affect those, those kind of calculations on theft. Um, three, one is simply that uh, a seller a seller doesn't know who's buying from them, but the buyer knows the seller, and semi-anonymity. And then the two other cases are just, again, the two first cases, but with money and credit in the picture. So two, 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 three have a significant threat of theft uh, in the form of the supplier, who's the only person who knows who they are, so the same person can steal from them, the latter from all other agents. Uh, and three, two, and three, uh, two, three, three, two, and three, three introduce credit, which reveals identity. So the credit is also only in three, two with your with the counterparty, the seller. Um, and then multilateral credit as your identity is revealed to all agents. Obviously, there are equilibria that exists where credit dominates as well, which is more likely that money dominates. 
Um, and then money reduces the possibility of theft. Again, I, I can't copy and paste every single <coughs> proof to, to get that one here. You have to take my word for it and, and go read the paper. Um, but consumers will prefer money's credit uh, in both the bilateral and full information credits uh, cases on the whole. Um, and we can see that from the example from the stakers before, where we said, you know, is this a credit situation? The multilateral example, uh, you know, might be relevant. And I think that's, you know, kind of one of my positions in the paper, which is like, hey, maybe we're categorizing this, this sort of wrong. Um, and then like a, a, just an aside as well, as they're always assuming that the value of money is enough to continue, continue supplying the goods. So again, an interesting kind of aside to them predicting something about an unstable system that is kind of relevant in highly volatile crypto assets. So crypto asset balances are known. Does this cause the same hazard to consumers as uh, you know holding goods, which are an asset? So their model only governs the theft of goods, not theft of credit and not theft of money. So I'm going to argue that yeah, there is kind of the same risk here, but it's it's obviously not perfectly fits their model. It's almost like I would need to write a paper where I extend their model, and that's almost like you know what this might be. Um, but the Balances being known um, does have like the same negative effect in the in that you reveal your visibility to all agents. You're in the dark forest, okay. Um, and others can see assets that are not the tokens themselves. So transact with tokens, you reveal you have an NFT. The NFT could plausibly be more valuable than anything you have in your wallet, right? Um, so there are three ways that we could extend this paper. Um, to examine risk, all of them I think are interesting, all of them I quite like to tackle in the future. Uh, first is treating crypto assets as money and modeling theft of money. It's worth saying that in them in their models, they only allow you to hold one unit of currency. But uh, if you allow infinite currency, it doesn't really change uh, their mathematical models. I think, however, it does change the maths on theft if you were to add in theft of money, right? Because you're in, your potential return is that much higher. Um, I think you can intuit that. I can't prove it. It's almost like, again, you'd have to like do the research and the maths and write a paper. So who knows? Uh, the second one is that, yeah, treat crypto assets as credit and model theft of identity and then theft of credit. So the interesting thing about credit is obviously that you can't just steal the credit. You also need to steal identity. And there's a whole bunch of stuff around the utility of credit and the negative utility to people who use credit that's also implied by this paper. It's really quite cool. I think, anyway. Um, and then the third one is you treat crypto assets good and, and you extend their theft of goods model to simply cover the assets themselves and just say, look, they're goods. We can treat them as something that could be stolen, which if we're assuming ledger rewrites, we can say. So we've sort of done that in a sense by saying ledger rewrites, loss events, targeted cyber attacks, somebody turning up in the house with a hammer, are all ways you can lose your private keys and just straight up lose a good that's in your possession, an asset, which might be tokens. Um, so yeah, and these are all you know, at risk from systemic factors. So the final thought on this paper, again, there's just so much in there. It is just really cool. I just think that's a great paper. Um, they also have a model for intermediated credit where you derive your, uh, you derive privacy by going to a banker and your risk there is essentially that a seller won't escrow a good when they say they're going to sell it and then the banker might steal from you, both of which are quite unlikely. But again, might be a, an interesting model for thinking about emissionless uh, and low trust environments. And, you know, how would you classify crypto assets in that context? So that's all of it. To recap, ledger rewrites happen often. I've given you a bunch of case studies on that, and that's just one ecosystem. The risk thresholds for users is knowledge of their existence. The entity that got $100 million worth of funds taken simply identified themselves. Like, all they did was exist, right? That, that was it. Um, and people are spending a lot of time, hundreds of millions of dollars on technologies to get better at doing uh, sort of traffic analysis, time-weighted graph analysis, all this sort of stuff on these ledges. And you know, anything with pseudonymity doesn't really protect you that much as long as they can find a link between a location and a balance. You know, People are interested in that information. I'll say no more on that anyway. Um, and crypto assets are maybe better to classify as credit if you follow the, the Khan et al. model. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other future work, which I'll leave on the slides. Essentially, like the more interesting ones are things about utility gain and loss by, by sellers with credit and whatnot. 
um, extend this to other ecosystems and looking at smart contracts. Finally, comment, which is UCL future money thing. Um, theory of change around privacy and CBDCs and digital cash. Um, and we think it's pretty useful thing that people might not think they need, but they do need it. And so, yeah, uh, we're going to build it. And if you're interested in collaborating on that, then you should like come work on it. It's pretty cool. Um, and that's it, really. Uh, so thank you. Like, you know, we do have 10 minutes for questions. So okay, well, at least, at least, yeah. What question, but I can maybe uh, make a comment. I mean, credit is usually a liability. Yeah. So when you call crypto assets, which is the asset on the account in terms on the asset side of the yeah. LC, if you call it as a liability, then it might get confused. Uh, I mean, I'm conceptually confused to Although I, I understand what you are trying to do, I get a little bit confused with the concepts because crypto assets as 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 stands is an asset, like money, like cash, like whereas credit is a liability term like loan, you know, short term or long term. So you know, figuring out or they say encapsulating an asset under the Food of the liability is a kind of confusing term for me. Just that. yeah. So I, I guess there's a semantics question there, which is I don't think we're saying. I don't know why I'm saying that it is. It has the properties of a liability in that sense. Merely that it fits the definition of credit according to this model of credit, which is that is extended in a multi-party, uh, sorry, multilateral sense from an issuer, and that defection from it will be punished by no longer having credit extended to you. Um, which is the property of credit described by their model. And I suppose in a situation where credit is extended, there has to be a, a kind of creditor, which this is maybe where actually maybe it is a liability because in a, in a proof of stake system, at least, because uh, you know, a ledger and its stakers extend you a balance, which they can potentially revoke. So maybe it is a, a liability in that sense. I don't know. Um, I don't think that was my intention, but... I'd have to think about that a bit more before I blanketly said, no, it's not a liability, because it might have some of the properties of one. Uh, I'd have to go away and have a think. But it's certainly not as simple as, I mean, maybe it is as simple as an asset. Or maybe <laughs> another wording can be used instead of the business credit. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think you're right that I need to. It probably is worth really heavily dis like being specific about the fact that when we say credit, we're referring to multilateral credit as described by Khan et al. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would be uh, you know it's an interesting point to raise, and I should probably go and look into whether or not it actually fits any model of credit more widely defined, which it might do. Who knows? Uh, I was wondering when you were describing the, the distribution the the, the the validators and how they were concentrated. Yeah. How did you get this information? How did you um, say observe this? And is this something that maybe is this something abuse over time or was it like many many cases the concentration is something that is right there? Right. So uh, I think I mentioned those were snapshots on a date. I think it was last week, twenty fifth of January, twenty twenty four. Um, I chose uh, uh, a number of chains with reasonable market cap reasonable in the Cosmos ecosystem, which have been launched at different times. So Osmosis and the Hub, you know, Hub is like four or five years old as a chain, Osmosis three, Juno two, say one, DYDX, three months, four months, something like that. So you can see that in general, right, again, this is a piece of, potential research you could very easily do. Um, I would expect that over time, it does actually, uh, to use the bucket definition of decentralization, which is economic uh, inequality, I would imagine that it does actually spread out. But I have no proof of that. And there are chains on there that are several years in production where it's still within the top 10 validators can stop the chain. And as somebody who's worked in that space a lot, every upgrade, every single software upgrade, is everybody upgrading and then a bunch of people trying to contact each other via other communication mediums to say, hey, has X 
number one ranked validator. Hey, has Y number two ranked validator upgraded? Does anybody know who to get in touch with from their team, especially institutional validators or VC backed ones? They're, they're often very slow off the mark and it ends up somebody somewhere makes a phone call to somebody they know there. And they're like, oh, are we down? Oh, sorry. You know, um, so, so yeah, I, I don't see it happening quickly from having like seen it evolve over time, but I don't know the exact snapshots of like where it's going other than it's much more concentrated than it should be. Uh, and it's a very long term. A, a, a metric that isn't even on there is that, you know, some of those uh, validator sets are 175 slots. So the idea that after slot nine, it's irrelevant is, is, it is not good when you're trying to tell a story about decentralization. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Cool, okay, uh, if that's it. And thank you.